Hey, how you doing? I wanted to be somewhere really beautiful, and I decided to come out to my friend K.C. Potter's house. He has been the dean out at Vanderbilt University for uh, 33 years, and he just retired about seven months ago. So it's great to have good friends like that, and he is a great friend. It's a slowly dawning realization of what you're attracted to. That's what it's like to come out to yourself. I could be myself more out here. I didn't have to be the dean. I think uh, being out here by myself did help me find not only solace, but peace about myself. It took me a long time before I discovered that I was gay. I was chased until I was 47 years of age. And of course, on a, a homophobic campus like Vanderbilt was, they definitely did not say anything. That, was, that would have been fighting words. So I never came out to university until after I retired. Meeting Richard then and coming out publicly made me me even more. When I deal with people here in this county, if it's normal for me to mention Richard as a partner, I do so. I don't beat around the bush with anybody. And so now I am me in a hell of a way. And if you don't like me, tough. And if you come around and bother me, I'll shoot you. <laughs> it's just that simple. I'm not going to worry about it. I was an actor too long and I'm not going to do it again. We just start living our life openly here, and that's not really done. We feel really good about it because we're not hiding. Casey did hiding enough in his life, and I was in gospel music and hiding at that time, and I didn't like that. Amy said, come to Nashville, it's all beginning to happen, and it definitely was at that time. It was a whole new genre. So stepping away from that was definitely hurtful. That's all I've ever wanted to do. And this is the part where we all kind of gather around the TV and watch what we have recorded. Whoa. No way. No way. I love it. No way. Because it was contemporary Christian music, that's the block because my mind is thinking about men. I didn't understand homosexuality that is not a choice. The thing is, at that time, James Dobson and the Focus on the Family started Exodus International, which was huge in the 80s. My church with my beloved pastor is tied into that world. So that's where those conversations start coming in about what can we do to pray this gay away. I went to Pentecostal church too for that, I remember now, off Bear Creek laying on of hands and tongues, ah, oh, na da sha na na you know, just like, so I'm like, hallelujah, it's over. I go out to a restaurant and he's like, oh my God, the guy with the beard just walked through, he's beautiful. You know, just the truth of it, it's like, it's not working. There's no question, I'm getting married. It's the top thing to do, so I don't have the problem anymore. My ex-wife did everything that she could to try to help me, and she's an amazing person, but it wasn't something that can be fixed. After my divorce, I was in my second year, and so I thought, okay, I need to really center in to who I am. And I was so fortunate uh, to be with Casey. I can't imagine being with anyone else. I come from a huge, large family of Portuguese immigrants. If you have someone who's lived a solitary life that long because they had to be, it's pretty ingrained. But you're really in love with this person, they're in love with you. It's a great match, but you're gonna have to figure out and navigate how do we make this work? I'm still waiting for the tuxedo birds to come. Yeah. He has allowed me to come in here and make the house a home. That's his love for me, because not everybody would do that. Richard, Richard, look, 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 look. Is it the tuxedo, tuxedo bird? It is, yes. <laughs> Start out doing this. Some of my thoughts when I'm 
whittling or how can I do this or how can I do that. And then occasionally it's just sort of enjoying the passing of time and not worrying about anything. You know, letting the dog do most of the worrying about squirrels around and stuff like that. When I first moved here, like about 20 years ago, Casey and I had to kind of really steer through that. How much are we out in this community? It's not like we're in a big city. For me, it was a liberating time, and so that's why I did a beautiful photograph of us in the coming out card. And that was the release to not only family and friends, but also to the community that we would be our authentic selves. My whole life has been a show. That's just the way I am. My passion, of course, is music and always has been. But in 1980, when I graduated high school, I kind of came up with the concept of being the fashion gardener. We need to do a photo shoot, and I went mannequins, like, totally working. And I'm going to be in a lounging chair like Martini, like, kicking back. How cool is that? What is it they say? Be careful what you wish for. Because next year makes 30 years that I have had a gardening business. It's got to be done a certain way that appeals to my clients and myself. I am the person who's going 100 miles a minute. So that was difficult in the beginning years. And in all honesty, it still can be difficult at times, especially as he's getting older. So I have to be aware of that and try to tone it down and have more centeredness on him. Because it is difficult, that younger, older relationship. There's a 23-year difference between us. I'm starting to feel the weight of that in the last couple years as he is getting older. It's the craziest thing because I was invited here in 1982 to do contemporary Christian music. I know today that is really not what it was about. It was to meet my life partner, Casey. Richard's hard to forget, right? He makes an impression. He would just come in to eat from time to time. Can I get you guys anything? Y'all doing okay? Then he let me into his life and shared with me about his growing up and coming out as a gay man. And then I felt comfortable enough to share my story with him of Jordan. I always still remember that moment. We were just driving home and he turned the radio down. I look over at him and I say, now buddy, I'm gonna ask you a question. I want you to understand that regardless of what your answer is to this question, that your mom and I love you no less, nothing will change. Okay. So I said, Jordan, do you think you're gay? He said, Daddy, I do. He didn't hesitate. I just remember him saying something like, you know, we know, and you know, it's totally okay. You know, we want you to know that it's okay. You know, you are who you are, and we love you for, you know, you no matter what. That's a big part of why we wanted to plant Hope Church, because I know there are other kids and young adults out there who at any given moment might feel like they're just ready to end it and jump off a bridge because nobody cares because I'm going to hell because I'm gay. And those things aren't true. I could always, you know, feel that people knew that I was different somehow, you know. Of course, you know, as gay people, they, you know, we just have a sense that, you know, people can tell. Yeah, I guess, like, known of Richard, I feel like everyone would know who Richard is. There's not a lot of gay people are here, so, you know, growing up, I just kind of just meet, you just meet somebody, you know, however. September 9th, 2018, I met TJ. We would like each other's stuff on Instagram. You know, that was where it started. Eventually met, drove up there to Cookville. I've only driven, like, 30 minutes from here or whatever, so it was, like, the farthest place I've ever driven to on my own, by myself, and I was very surprised I did that. When I met Jordan, I knew that he'd be something more than just a boyfriend. My first, like, I'm in a relationship. <laughs> like, ooh, like, I'm in a relationship. 
nothing beforehand was really that serious. This, this is the first real serious thing. If you want to begin your redemption story today, then you have to make some changes in your life and it's gonna be painful and it ain't gonna be easy. Internally how I was wired, you don't have sex before you're married and you only marry the opposite sex and they currently both kind of reside just in his room at our house. Who want to encourage you to live your best life and be your best person. And I'm okay with it in my spirit and in my heart because I want my son to be safe. They can live there forever as far as I'm concerned. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me. There's something about rooting for an underdog. It's sort of the David and Goliath thing. It's very biblical. We like to see the person that's not supposed to win, win. The climate at Vanderbilt was terribly conservative. Hey, Jim. I spent a lifetime uh, working with the young people, which is what I wanted to do. How are you, buddy? I'm great. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing all good right. To see you. Yeah, good to see you. Come on in. That was worth uh, a lot to me. It still is worth a lot to me. But I had to cave in to the repression in order to do it. I was in charge of 5,000 undergraduate students, their social life, their well being, their discipline. I wanted to be trusted and society did not trust gay men at that time. So we have to protect ourselves the best we can. And secrecy was one way that uh, we did it over the years. Yeah, I was scared to death. Knew I was gay, I didn't know, I didn't know anybody at Vanderbilt. Remember the old days of Lambda when there was like a phone with an answering machine? Yeah. Instead of announcing there was a meeting for gay rights or whatever, we simply ran an ad which said a support group was forming, and if you would make a phone call to a certain telephone, then we would contact you. I think anybody can see that that would be a very difficult thing to start from, but we did it. The students there couldn't stop talking to each other. Mm -hmm. It was like it's just they could be open and. Because when you got back to the dorms, yeah. it was yeah. not a safe space anymore. That's all right. I think my story is important in terms of the history of leading the university towards recognizing that gays are worthy people who need to be protected. Without that group and without you, I would not be the person I am today. Well, I would not have achieved I'm, what I've done today. I'm honored to hear you say that, of course. You were there for us. You got the non-discrimination policy passed. Without yeah. you, it would not have been there. I don't think that at the time that many of us realized what you were putting on the line and yeah. how pioneering you were. Yeah. When we became suspicious about the number of suicides on campus, we conducted hearings over a semester, once a week, we invited everybody in the community to come and say what they thought and whether or not students should be protected uh, from discrimination. We only had one or two student groups show up that were of a more religious nature uh, who spoke against it. Uh, but we listened to them all. So then it went to the Student Affairs Committee of the Board of Trust. And at the end of it, the chair of the Student Affairs Committee said that he had read my report and that after listening to these students, he had changed his situation 180 degrees. It was not as legal as some people wanted at the beginning, but it was the first step. Whenever I was informed that the Gay Center was to bear my name, at first I was a little bit embarrassed because I didn't think that I would deserve such an honor. The chancellor came and spoke and I spoke, and at one point, the chancellor had tears in his eyes because of the things that I was saying about what we had been dealing with in terms of student health. He actually had tears in his eyes. I was moved by that. We gather here to celebrate us, our community, and those who support us. We come here to be amongst those who understand and share our commitment to a more inclusive and socially just campus. We come together to remember that this is the 10th year of our home, the Casey Potter Center at Vanderbilt University.
Richard went to, to the dedication, and before I began the main part of my speech, I introduced Richard to the crowd and said, Richard, I love you. <laughs> he wasn't expecting it. <laughs> So I declared to the world right there, then and there. <laughs> he sort of led me all along. For the past 12 years of my last years on the Vanderbilt campus, the gay students met at my house every Thursday night, and we dealt with that issue over and over again. Mm -hmm as they would become bolder and bolder about where they were with their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes time. He will need lots of friends. That's where I've worried about Jordan. I want him to have a beautiful life. You but know, you there's... don't want him to be secretive all the rest of his life. No, the I way I was until be... I was 58 years right. old. Mm. I want him yeah, to be yeah. him right now. But I yeah. know that I have to let him, we have to let him do this on his own. Absolutely. He's going to come through this with flying colors because he's got your old support. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's the important thing. And I'm not so sure, too, how much, <clears throat> because his mom and dad are pastors, how much that hinders that process of, yeah, the preachers golly, can't you know, the preacher's kid thing. Yeah, 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 and that's a real Because he would not dare bring, you know, shame and reproach upon mm. us, you know, right. uh, in his mind, thinking, you know, yeah. uh, he would never do anything to, you know, embarrass us or anyone. Mm -hmm. Now, all that being said, I don't want to, I don't want, <clears throat> I need to be transparent. Uh, so, I had uh, a few folks ask me if I would, if I would perform a gay ceremony. I asked Jordan, uh, I said, so if, if a gay couple asks me to marry them, I said, what do you think I should do? Yeah. And he said, you should do what you think is right. Oh, phenomenal. It's pretty powerful indeed it's for, very a, powerful. for a kid. Yeah, As opposed to saying, amazing. oh, Dad, I'm gay, you're supposed to marry. He said yeah. no, because he knew awesome. my conscience. Mm -hmm. And and I have a lot of baggage that I've got to unpack. Again, trying to be completely honest and open about it, that there's wow. still, I still have struggles. I appreciate that, I still too. have struggles. Um, and, uh, but I'm working on them, you know. Uh, I don't want to change just for the sake of thinking, I should just change. I, it, yeah. it, it has to be it's something to that be I believe. a hard thing for you. I was raised in a Baptist church, and it was always, gays are going to hell. And so for the longest time, I was like, why would God go through all the time, or the thought of creating me, so that he's like, when you die, you're going to hell. Wouldn't that defeat the purpose? It wasn't until I met Devin and saw the relationship that not only he played in his son's life, but in his community's life, that, you know, me being a gay man doesn't mean that I can't be in church. I had known since I was like 13, 14 that I liked men, but for the longest time, I knew I needed to keep my mouth shut because I didn't want to accept it myself. And it got so bad to where I, I could not focus in school. Like, school was so bad for me. People made it like a mission to hunt me down. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the hour and in the moment when I need you the absolute very most, you left me. And I don't anticipate nor desire for you to raise your hand if you have ever felt that way, but you have, and I have too. Called my mom. I was like, Mom, I swear to God, if you leave me at school, I'm going to get on the bus. I'm going to go home. You're going to come home to one less child. I will kill myself. I literally pray to God every night before I go to sleep that it's the last time I do it. I'm so tired of living. Please, please come get me from school. And she hung up the phone, and she came and got me, and she was all in tears coming and getting me. And I didn't explain why I hadn't told anybody or why I was keeping it from everybody because, you know, I wasn't out of the closet or anything, so. What does the resurrection story really mean to you? Here's what I know, is that far more he is concerned about your resurrection than he is about his. I feel like coming out, I feel like that's something that's highly overrated. The question, are you gay, may be the end of the world to someone that's 15 right now in high school that has not told anybody in the world. Jesus says, preach good news. Jesus says, preach hope. That's where a good church family comes in. 
to have folks near and dear to you who can help you along the way. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, you, you've become a hero of mine. Oh, really? Absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah. No, no. yeah. Yeah, 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 no, no. yeah. I definitely have a lot of big plans with Jordan. In good time. I don't want to rush anything, but I also want to be a dad. I want to be someone that my kids can come to. Meeting Jordan was the first time I was ever concerned with what life was going to be like after I died. There's some beautiful Easter. So I have a, a baptism here. Nice. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Glory upon your confession of faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died for your sins. I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. Amen. I would definitely feel like I'm just as important to Jesus Christ as anyone else. Studying about that good old way, show the robe and crown. Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down. Come on down. I've never really been faced with, I hope this doesn't end or I hope this lasts after I die, which is something I would say about Jordan. This is something that if I could keep me forever, I would keep it. I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son. Oh, sinners, let's go down, let's go down, won't you come on down? I don't have a family to do stuff with this like so it brings a lot to me. You've got us for your family. So so happy. Okay. Well, put the food on the table and let's do it. I don't have a family that's really religious or in tune with each other, so it means a lot that I have Jordan and his family for stuff like this, you know? Hey, TJ. What's up, buddy? Richard and I would like to invite you to dinner one night this week. Is okay. that possible? Mm -hmm. He's we, like he already on it. He's like, OK. Yeah. Uh, and we would like Jordan to come mm. so we can get to know you better. OK. I mean, so excited. I look forward to it. It's amazing how you can believe a certain thing until it affects your family, until it affects your home, until it affects your community. We got another good one here. I believe he's the best one so far. I still struggle with some things, and it's it's still a process for me. So where did you and Richard meet? I met him shortly after New Year's at a restaurant downtown. And uh, this man walked in, he's tall, and handsome, uh, had on cowboy boots. And I said, no, that, that wouldn't be him. <laughs> so he turned around and he said, are you Mr. Potter? And I said, well, I guess he is him, you know. I really had no idea that I would be 
looking at a partnership of 20 years. Yeah, I bet not. Yeah. It's a long time. Yeah. Pizza here. Mm -hmm. I don't romance here. It's sincerely my internal struggle with my very conditioned belief that homosexuality is a sin and that it's wrong and that you have to repent of it and you have to be married to, be in a relationship with somebody of the opposite sex. It's hard to get out of that, but I'm going to, come hell or high water. But the bottom line, period, the bottom line is I love my son and I want the best for him and I trust him. And if this is the lifestyle that he will continue to follow, then God bless him and I'll be with him every step of the way.